I love the uh, creativity and the uniqueness you bring to our sanctuary. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Well, grand rising, everyone. As uh, grand rising, yes. And as as uh, Reverend Judy said, our theme this year is grand rising, and we're looking at what that really means. If you were to go into the uh, Caribbean, you would hear that as a um, the average greeting that they give each other in that culture. And so we're, um, we're adopting it this year. We're looking at how we can really step into a, a bigger way of being, a grand way of being. And we're looking at our philosophy and the things that we teach in this philosophy about how we can step into a more conscious and grander experience. We, I do want to mention that we have a class coming up. Um, it is uh, the inner Inward Journey, and it's three nine-week sessions that will go all through next year, and it really is about that grand rising. If you are interested in taking that class, please speak with me. There are some prerequisites for that class, but at the, as a whole, it is a deeper dive into uh, our own journey along the path of this philosophy. And so I encourage you to consider it if you're thinking about it. As I said, we have this year-long theme and we chunk it down by month. And so this month we're talking about pieces into peace. And um, last week we talked about this idea of inner peace. And so if, uh, if you'll change the slide, Mary. Um, uh, and today's topic is waking up into oneness. And so I've, I've really looked at the trajectory of the different themes and topics for this month, and I really see it as the pathway to peace. I see that there's a, you know, last week we looked at uh, ourselves, the work that we have to do to get grounded in our own inner peace. And, I, and I, there's this great quote from the founder of Centers for Spiritual Living, Ernest Holmes, um, and he writes in this thing called you, when you become confused, stop and listen to your inner calm. Turn from the confusion to that deeper something within and say, I am submerged in peace. I am surrounded by peace. I am immersed in peace. There is nothing but peace. Deep peace deep, calm, undisturbed peace. And so there's this, I gave you an assignment, if some of you might have had the opportunity to do that in the busy day-to-day -day life that we all lead, of spending some time in nature so that you could have that opportunity to allow nature to reflect back to you that inner peace that already lives in you and to have an opportunity to have a greater revelation of that. And, and, and so now this week, we take it to the next step on the pathway to peace, and that is looking at our relationships, you and me. How do we um, work in those relationships? And so um, you can change the slide, right? So here we are in the next continuum of looking at you and me, looking at those personal relationships we have, looking at um, how sometimes and I love using this word because it describes it as, as, as none other, and that is that sometimes in our relationships we other. And oftentimes we use that to describe a noun, but I'm using it as a verb. We other. And, and what that means is that we get so wrapped up in othering other people. We get so wrapped up in our judgments. We get so wrapped up in the things that are, we're thinking about that we allow ourselves to drop down into this deep belief of separation. And one of the key principles in our philosophy is oneness. Now, obviously, there are a number of people in this room, clearly there, are, there is a you and there is a me, but what we know about oneness is that it speaks to the more of who we are individually. That the oneness that we're looking at is the 
oneness that is true of each one of us. That, that thing that makes the grass grow, that thing that animates our body, that thing that um, uh, coordinates all life, if you will, at some level, is common to each one of us. And in that commonality, we are one. It's a big concept. Sometimes it takes, a, it takes some time to get your head wrapped around it. If you're on the five in LA, oneness is sometimes hard to come by, right? <laughs> because there's a lot of people around you. I remember when I was first invited to come down here and uh, apply for your position as your senior minister, we, came, we were coming down the grapevine and into f five and into the metropolitan area and my part, excuse me, my partner at the time turned to me and said, there's 10 lanes of traffic. <laughs> what the heck? Um, there's a lot of people here. And so it's easy to, I'll say it this way, become unconscious and step into our othering to begin to look around us and see our differences. Heck, we were brought up, I don't know about you, but my kids watched Sesame Street. And, you know, one of these things is not like the other. Come on, you could sing it if I asked you to, right? One of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. <laughs> <I'm stopping. laughs> right, you know the tune. We were brought up with this idea. We've been, we've been domesticated it, domesticated to look for differences, to look for separation. But when you show up in a philosophy like this, we're going to ask you to suspend your uh, training, if you will, as a human being in this culture, and to look at life a little differently. Um, when we started our services today, in the middle of the song, we did something called a namaste. And that is a traditional uh, Eastern greeting where the divine in me honors and recognizes the divine in you. It is uh, intrinsic to this message about our relationships and finding peace in that, those relationships as we move through our our day-to-day -day with them. Let's see. A lot of times when we step into this this action or this behavior of othering, it stems from a place of not feeling protected or safe. We don't necessarily recognize that right at the moment, but behind it, underneath it, is usually some kind of protective behavior that we step into when something is not working for us, when it's messy. But when it's messy, it's also magical. <laughs> Because there is something happening. There's, there is an opportunity for us to begin to be more present with each other. Yet, I don't know about you, but in my, you know, when I was coming up, that wasn't how I was brought up. I was brought up when I was in conflict that I was going to, talked about this last month, I think, you know, I was going to freeze, flee, or flight. I was going to, you know, check out, withdraw. But when we come to those places in our relationships that are n not peaceful, right? We're, we're experiencing some rub, some conflict, some trigger. It really is an opportunity for us to see what's underneath that. And I think that it really calls for us to exercise the practice of forgiveness. Now, forgiveness has gotten a, a great deal of press in the last 20 years. It's pretty much a com you know, there was a time when that was, we, you, when you thought about forgiveness, it was like, oh, who do I have to say I'm sorry to? But, but forgiveness is so much more than the transactional, I'm sorry when something goes south. Forgiveness is transformational. Forgiveness is an act and a, behavior and something we can lean into to shift the experience that we're having. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems like 
I have more and more places to practice this forgiveness. <laughs> and I have, you know, in my relationships with, with others, in my relationship with, um, with clients and clientele, um, uh, in my relationship with family, oh boy, that is the place where I can really exercise my forgiveness muscle. <laughs> right, my forgiveness muscle. <laughs> Let me see those guns, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about forgiveness and, and to look at it as, as more of an opportunity to transform ourselves and an opportunity for us to really step into, just like I reappropriated that term othering into a verb, I want to look at forgiveness as a spiritual practice, not just a transaction to um, uh, reduce conflict or to um, find some way to be able to work with each other on the surface. And I um, love how the Course in Miracles talks about forgiveness. And if you're familiar with the Course in Miracles, it came out in the 70s and it was um, a, a channeled doc document that was channeled through a woman who was brought up as a Jewish woman, and yet here she was receiving this download from a, I, I would say, metaphysical Christian perspective. And when you look at Of Course in Miracles, what you find is that it's steeped in forgiveness, and it's steeped in this idea that in order for us to uh, let go of the surfacey places we are in life where we get attached and we have the conflict. And in order to find that greater peace, forgiveness is the mechanism that brings us back to love. It is the mechanism that re reminds us who we really are. That I am not I can never be truly separate from you. You can never truly be separate from each other. That indeed we are individuals that are connected at a deep, intrinsic, mystical level. And the Course offers three different steps to finding inner peace. As a matter of fact, the organization that holds the copyright on that material is called the Inner Peace Foundation. And um, those uh, steps are really simple. When we find ourselves in a place of unease, when we find ourselves in a place of conflict, we can first look at and acknowledge that the outward picture that we see around us is a reflection of our inward condition. It's the outward experience that we have with others is a reflection of our inward condition. And so therefore we need to acknowledge the judgments that we have. Or as Brene Brown likes to say, she likes to start when she's exploring the judgments that she has, she likes to say, the story I'm telling myself is, right? because we're always telling ourselves a story. We're always making up, we're trying to fill in the gra gaps, we're, we're dealing with our preconceived notions, we're working with our perceptions. And, and these are, this is the story that we make up that often is the thing that hooks us into a, and, and lights up our triggers. <laughs> when we are having that experience of, of challenges and not being in peace with each other. The Course goes on to say that the second step is to begin to look at the inner condition that comes from our belief in separation. So first we acknowledge that we're making up a story, and then we recognize that that story is steeped in a lie. It's steeped in a lie that, that we're separate that we, we aren't united, that we aren't all God in form having a human experience. And so if we can do those two, if we can pause long enough, if we can step back from whatever the emotional upheaval is that, that comes forward for us, then we can begin to have a greater 
uh, revelation, if you will, with, with what's underneath our belief in separation and the judgments and the storytelling that comes up around that. And then finally, the Course says, we experience peace when we become conscious of our belief in the illusion of separation and how our judgments bring us to that. And so I want to illustrate that in a, in a story. Last week I told you I, was, I had just come back from a vacation with my family. We have a, a long history, we've been almost 30 years, we've been going to the same beach on the East Coast. I'm originally from the East Coast. And, and, um, and so, you know, it reminds me of all the, all the experiences I've had with family on vacation. And I pause for a minute as you think about the vacations you've had with family. Oftentimes they're wonderful. And then there's the places where we rub up against each other, right? Because we're with family and that's a place where we can begin to feel safe enough to let our guard down and let it all hang out. <laughs> um, and I will tell you that my sister and I had a very contentious relationship growing up. And by the time, you know, we were in our 20s, we were living, you know, 400 miles apart. And that would not have surprised anyone. But as we uh, matured, we decided we wanted to have a relationship. And so we started this tradition of vacationing together every summer. And, um, and it was a wonderful experience at first. And, and then we started rubbing into our past behaviors and our judgments. And, the, you know, and the, the, it's the kind of like when you stub your toe and you act like you broke your legs, like we, we <laughs> we, metaphorically. And so there was this, I guess we were in our third or fourth year in this new ritual that we had of vacationing together. Um, my sister was, it was her and her husband's turn to make dinner and they were preparing dinner and we, be, we got into a fight. And it seemed like a very insignificant thing that brought up this knock down, drag out fight. We got into a fight over a piece of cheese. <laughs> Apparently, she, I'm not going to get into it. It was a piece of cheese. <laughs> so we shared some words. I got storming mad. I grabbed my car keys and I stormed out of the house as everybody was sitting down for dinner. I'm 400 miles from home. Where was I going to go? <laughs> So I start, you know, I'm just going to drive into town and I'm driving down the road and I'm driving mad. And suddenly I realize I've missed a turn somewhere. And I come to this dead end and I'm still fuming. And I look up to see where I'm at. And I'm not making this up. The street sign said, make peace way. Make peace way. I, I, was, I was incredulous. I couldn't believe it. I was like, I even said out loud, it's not funny, God. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, when all this happened, I was on my spiritual path, and so I'm learning what it means to be more conscious. And I say, okay, I'll take a hint, but I'm not ready to go home yet, right? I'm still in my judgment. I'm still in my angst and my triggers. I'm still looking at how uh, this overreaction I had to our exchange. And so I decide to drive into town and have dinner and settle down a little bit and really reflect on my part in it and, and, and how silly it was. It's like I, I, and I came back after dinner. Everything was settled. And my sister and I did make peace. But we didn't, it wasn't like I came in and we pretended like nothing happened. Because that's what happens a lot of times, isn't it? That's how we make peace. We pretend like the, the exchange didn't happen and we just make nice. That's the thing I love about my sister. She won't let me get away with that. <laughs> She's conscious too. She's on this path as well. And so we ended up sitting down and, and really exploring the past behaviors that led to this projection, if you will, and, and this overreaction. And I will tell you that that is probably the pivotal place in our relationship where we began to do the work of unbundling our judgments 
and being conscious about what was ours and being willing to be honest with each other and explore it and come to a place that's peaceful. I learned that here. I learned that in a center just like this. And it, uh, today I will tell you my favorite person in the world, Lonnie Chavez, my sister. We're very close. And that's because we were willing. I, actually, it's, I'm going to say it's because of that street sign. <laughs> Make peace way. And, and what I can tell you is when you find yourself in relationships and you find yourself in a place where it feels like there is no way through, the divine always provides a way through. The divine always gives us street signs, signals, that if we pay attention to them, we will know which way to go. You don't have to, you're not in this alone. You have the principles of this philosophy. You have the power and the presence of the thing that animates your body temple and all the world around you that is cheering for you. Now, I, I don't want to, you know, uh, personify that thing that makes the grass grow, but I do know that this thing we refer to as spirit, God, divine, it only wants to create and give of itself. That's another principle of this philosophy that we study, that there is a power that's moving through us that wants to create and give of itself. And that, it, that thing itself, as, as Ernest Holmes refers to it, as I like to refer to it as, as God or the divine, it's not a reflection of our human self. No, that would be projecting again. No, that divine essence in its purest form gives us an opportunity to find it in us. And when we have these things called relationships, it is a wonderful opportunity to tease out all the um, obstructions all the judgments, all the stories that we place between ourselves and the divine in the form of humanity. Yeah. Now, when you're in the middle of being triggered, I'm not going to walk up to you and say, you know, you're being triggered. That person's God too. <laughs> but what I want to suggest is that you allow your emotions to complete themselves. You allow your feelings to complete themselves so you can pause long enough to recognize and see your judgments and to remember that everything is a projection, that this, you know, my teacher used to say that um, it's just a, a fun house of mirrors, <laughs> you know. We are projecting ourselves onto each other when we don't see our oneness. And so this this what may seem like an elusive idea of oneness is actually very accessible to us. And it's accessible to us through our willingness to suspend our judgments and our story and to pause, to remember that there is no exception. God recreates itself in all of life. And so that person, that family member that you're struggling with, they're struggling too. I think it's important to recognize that when we can pause, when we're in conflict, when we're struggling with a relationship, and we're reaching for forgiveness, that doesn't always mean that I'm going to give you a pass because you're doing harm. That's not what I'm talking about at all. But what I am talking about is stepping away and pausing and getting clear so that you'll be guided by the divine to, for what's yours to do. And sometimes what's yours to do will be to step outside of that relationship. Sometimes what's yours to do will change the way you communicate in that relationship. Sometimes what's yours to do is to limit your association with that person so that you can step away and get that perspective of oneness. And the tricky thing about a world that works for all is that the person you're in conflict with, it, it's got to work for them too. 
It's not just a world that works for me. Boy, if this was easy, everyone would be doing it, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's so worthwhile. You know, my illustration of my relationship with my sister, you know, now we have such a deep relationship and it came from forgiveness. And, and it wasn't about me saying I'm sorry, although I did say I was sorry because I was her big sister. And, and if you're a, a second or third in the birth order, you know how, what a pain, literally, uh, big siblings can be. So I did have some apologizing to do, but the, what I really had to do was amend my relationship with her. And I did that through forgiveness. And I did that through a willingness to um, see her differently and to see my part in it so that I could really come to a place of peace and waking up to oneness. And when we can do that in those most contentious relationships, then we start to step out of that little circle into those other relationships. And next week, Reverend Karen will be talking about that. So my, my invitation to you is really to take a, um, a page out of Brene Brown's strategy. And when you are in that place where you're getting all spun up in a rela personal relationship, ask yourself this question or begin to, as you reflect on your what you're experiencing, start with the story I'm telling myself. And then identify if it's really real or if there's another perspective that you could embrace. And that will be one more step closer on our pathway to peace. Thank you very much. And so, we do this thing called uh, affirmative prayer. And so I'm going to do an affirmative prayer right now. And if you'll join me, I invite you to simply close your eyes and take it in, knowing that there is a power and a presence that is everywhere present, that there is no exceptions to the presencing of the divine in all of life, in the things that we love and the things that we don't love so much, God is present. So we recognize this, this amazing, powerful, creative, loving beingness that wants to experience life by means of us. And we allow ourselves to recognize that creative power in ourselves as well that there can be no separation if there's only oneness. And so we dissolve the ideas of separation. We allow ourselves to be one with the divine nature in life. And we use that as our guide point. Uh, the thing that helps us know what is the next thing to do. And so I trust as we move through this week, as we consider what it is that we want to transform. We allow ourselves to see forgiveness as a way to transform the situation. And we're not doing it alone. We have this philosophy, this community, our, our other conscious friends, and our own inner peace to draw from. And so I know this week as we explore our stories and our judgments and are willing to see things from a different perspective, that we are guided, guarded, and protected. That the highest good comes forward with ease, with grace, and tangibly. So we anchor ourselves in this highest truth, knowing that there is a presence that is moving in as and through us. We allow ourselves to be that peace that wants to show up in the world today as humanity, we start right where we are. We trust the process. We let go and surrender. And we accept the greater peace that wants to be known. I give great thanks for this ability to be conscious in any situation, to, to know when it is mine to detach, to let go, to trust God. And it is with a thankful and willing heart that I simply anchor this prayer 
in that power that makes the grass grow and the stars revolve in the universe, knowing that anything is possible. And together we say, and so it is.